Good morning and welcome to this uh, Governors for Schools webinar. The focus of this morning's session is effective questioning and challenging for governors. Uh, just before we start, I hope everybody can hear us. I mean, one or two people have uh, are saying good morning back on the uh, question panel already, so that's always a good sign. Um, hopefully you can all see the uh, dashboard in front of you. Um, just a quick, if we could, a quick sound check. Actually, no, we don't need to do a sound check. Everyone's coming back and telling us they're here. That's lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think yeah, we've got everything working fine. Uh, my name... Oh, I've done that wrong. We seem to have a little uh, a little issue on the first slide. Uh, there are two of us here this morning. My name is Steve Barker, and I'm joined by uh, Linda Waghorn. Good morning. Um, whose name isn't on the slide, but it's on the one in front of me. So I'm sorry, I'm not sure what's happened there. Uh, we are representing Better Governor here this morning. We'll say a little bit more about that later, but uh, this is part of a series of webinars that we're delighted to actually facilitate on behalf of Governors for Schools. Um, good morning. And today's session, we're going to be looking at uh, how as governors, as parts of boards in the variety of different places we sit on, on our boards, how, we, how and where we challenge within uh, our role. We'll look at what the Department for Education uh, have to say to us about uh, the helpful things that might inform that. And we'll look at opportunities uh, where governors uh, and board members can exercise that challenge and we're going to involve you quite a lot in today's session uh, so that you feel that you're confident and you'll be equipped to um, to carry out those uh, those questioning uh, activities in your own uh, boards. So if we uh, start right at the very beginning uh, there are three key functions that the, that any board, whether you're in a maintained school or an academy or free school, have. And that first one, the top line, is being really clear about where your school or academy is heading. Uh, and then sitting uh, alongside that is the ethos of your school and your values. Uh, and also, uh, you, uh, through your strategic vision, you set that direction, you set your uh, school improvement plans. The second key function then is holding the head teacher to account for those plans um, and that you're measuring the success of those plans, the progress of those plans and the performance of the pupils and of the staff. Uh, and then the third function is because we are using public money, making sure that the financial performance of our school or academy is done really well and making sure that the money that we receive is spent on the right things with the right impact. We have very recently, you'll see uh, March 2019, had a new governance handbook. And again, this is for governors in all types of schools and academies. And interestingly, feeding on from a whole range of different um, pieces of work that Ofsted have carried out over the last few years. This slide itself is taken from a, a Sean Harford uh, presentation. He's the National Director of Schools for Ofsted. Uh, and this um, building on some of the work that Ofsted have been doing, the research that they've been doing, uh, both in uh, early years foundation stage and a three phase consultation on uh, the new Ofsted frameworks and, and thinking about how our curriculum is designed in each school to meet the needs of our pupils. There are higher expectations of, of governors. Uh, and you'll see that the, the comments here about inquisitive independent minds, that is based on the fact that all boards now are made up of people who bring with them some particular skills and expertise that will allow them to have professional conversations, professional dialogue, and focus back on those key strategic issues. So it, it's vital that those three core functions that I mentioned on the previous slide, that you understand how your board carries those out. Uh, and then there are some key characteristics that governors and board members need to have. And the humility, the good judgment, the resilience and determination, these are all based on having that inquisitive, independent um, minds and the skills that you bring so that you understand the issues in your school uh, and can inform those conversations. 
excuse me. So if we look at the competency framework, the competency framework is a, a document that accompanies the governance handbook and it sets out um, the kind of competencies that board members should bring to the table as a group. And the very beginning part of that, after we've thought about the Nolan principles and the kind of behaviours that all people in public life ought to have, there are a set of, of seven um, personal attributes and there are two here that I want to focus on in particular. So the first of those is being curious and I think this is a really key skill for board members uh, supporting all of their work but particularly supporting the work of being able to challenge and question effectively. You have to be curious enough uh, as a, a governor or board member to look at the school in detail, to think about the papers and read the papers that you are uh, being presented with for your different board meetings and to consider as you read through that, that information, are there any pieces of information that I want to test further? Are there any questions that this rises uh, arises in my mind as a result of that? And what else is available to me that supports this understanding? So for a new board member, you might be looking at the website, finding out a bit more of the school through that medium. You might be conducting governor visits either as a new board member or as a board member with a particular responsibility. But you need to be curious enough to find out. You need to know the headlines of your school, the school priorities that it set itself for the year, uh, and you need to be able to develop an understanding of that through being curious. The second one then, which is a, a, a key attribute here, is uh, being able to challenge conventional wisdom and be open-minded about new approaches. Now, for the vast majority of our schools, our school leaders have come up through the medium of education. There are few uh, senior leaders in school who have had, uh, who have developed expertise in a, in a different uh, organisational environment. But for because governors are coming from that skills-based background, many of you as board members will bring with you a whole range of different um, skill sets that have been tested in, in external organisations. And it is this, these skills, these attributes, that are really beneficial to our senior leaders to be able to challenge the way things are, have been done in the past and to bring up new approaches, new ideas. So these two together, finding out, being curious about how things work, why things work in a particular way, and then saying, how can I apply the skill set that I bring with me to make this organisation better? It creates that partnership of governors, external leaders and internal school leaders with that professional um, uh, educational expertise. I think one of the things I would say there, Linda, is that uh, we, um, as governors with different skill sets, etc., one of the things that on that creative side in terms of challenging it's, it, it's the uh, accepted wisdom, etc., is that things like change management, things like risk management are probably everyday um, items for many people from coming to governors, but they're areas where governors can actually bring a very fresh and welcome perspective in schools, I think is a good example of that. So I'm just at saying someone actually put a message up to say, is anybody else having problems hearing you? Um, nobody else has said so yet. Uh, if you are having individual problems, we've got a very good strength of signal here this morning, apparently. Um, so it might be worth checking your own volume levels and strength of first signal. Um, thank you very much. We've got quite a few people coming back saying no, audio seems fine with them. So that's lovely. Thank you. OK, well, moving on. Um, one of the questions I posed myself is in, um, with Linda preparing for this session this morning, I said, well, what do we actually understand by this term challenge? And uh, I'm sorry, this is very boring of me. I'm a bit of a pedant in my spare time, to say the least. And so I actually looked at the dictionary definition. And I think 
a lot of us can see where perhaps the worst case scenario is governance goes wrong because of a misunderstanding here. Many of you will be familiar with that term critical friend. And I think over many years, uh, people like Linda and I, who've been uh, involved in uh, delivering government training and facilitating government development sessions for many years, have thought that lots of people mis misunderstood what this term critical friend meant. Criticism can be constructive. Criticism should be constructive. It shouldn't always be negative. And I think the same is true of challenge. And I would uh, uh, draw your attention to, uh, sorry, I'm on the wrong screen here. There we go. I would draw your attention to this uh, second part of the, uh, uh, the, the noun uh, version of challenge rather than the verb. Um, a call to prove or justify something. Now, you know, that, that's, again, that sounds a little pejorative. It's not as strong as that, but I think one of the things that I would actually suggest that people think about is that, well, yes, we are perhaps not standing against, but we're actually asking, yeah, please explain to me. It's, it's, it's that test of, the challenge can be a test. It's, Tell me a bit more so I actually de deepen my understanding. I think what I'd like to what I'd like to do as a governor is actually understand this. That's why I'm asking my questions. And the, the idea of a challenge shouldn't be seen in any kind of um, aggression terms at all. Um, it's not disputing. It's not saying I don't believe. It's just a call for more detailed information. So that as governors, we're able to put into context that role of ours, which is. Uh, all about ensuring that the school is providing the best possible standards of learning, the best possible standards of care. And it can be as simple as just testing your own understanding uh, that you have, what you've received and what you've read uh, means what you think it does. Okay, so I think really if we're talking about effective challenge within the environment of the school, what we're actually saying is that those questions for governors which demonstrate good challenge, demonstrate effective challenge, should be about those strategic items, they should be about those strategic processes. So you know, we should be asking questions to ensure we understand the school's vision, as Linda mentioned, that's part of one of our, our, our key, um, or core values rather, I should say, as, uh, sorry, core functions rather, as governors. We should be thinking about the direction that the school is moving in. It should always be a positive one. It should always be one that uh, focuses on improvement. But do we understand that the priorities for the school are the right ones? Are we convinced that we've got enough information to make those decisions that have a, an impact on the future direction of the school as governors? So it's just about putting it into context, I, I would suggest. And that brings us on to our first poll of the session today. And what we wanted to do is um, just pose a question really and get you to uh, respond in terms of where you are as individuals in terms of your own approach to um, questioning and to providing that uh, uh, element of challenge in your own governing body. So I'm going to launch the poll now and hopefully that will come up on your screen. My screen will disappear temporarily there. Sorry. So you should, ought to be able to see the, the uh, uh, question in front of you now. And I can see that some people are beginning to vote already. So you've got four options there. Um, please uh, indicate the one that uh, closest, closest fits your own uh, perspective. Most people have voted there, so just a couple more moments and then we will uh, close the poll and give you the, uh, the results. Um, just while we're doing that, there's a question coming in or a comment coming here from uh, Wendy. Wendy's saying the senior team come over to me as rather defensive. When we ask questions for clarification, we could tend to get a good news response rather than a pause for reflection. I think that's a very interesting point, um, Wendy, and certainly historically I, I know I've actually encountered that in some governing bodies. I do think now there is a, a new breed of school leaders that actually welcome and encourage governors to actually ask questions and to bring that sense of challenge because they realise that that does actually add value to governors. I think we're, we're going to come on to perhaps some of the, you know, the chalk face strategies we might want to use a little bit later. So if I can ask you to hold that thought, we will actually come back to you. Uh, we've got so, uh, Ruth here is saying that she's a client, not a governor. It doesn't matter. I think uh, it's uh, perhaps that you, but, but 
answer the question in terms of where you think your governing body are at the moment is absolutely fine. On and that I one think day. for clerks, what I would suggest, and there are uh, there are a couple of you that have uh, raised questions as clerks, is that how comfortable and confident are you about providing advice and guidance during meeting? Because that is the same skill set I would suggest. Okay, we're going to close the poll there and share the results with you, and they should come up on your screen right now. Um, so we've got some interesting variation. We've got just under 20% of you say so they're very confident, um, which is fantastic. Um, overwhelming majority, reasonably confident, but want to improve. Well, that's great. Uh, that's a very, yeah, that's a, a very positive attitude to have. And certainly all of us, um, hopefully are on that same trajectory as uh, constantly want to improve our practice as governments as we do in other walks of life. And we've got a few people that uh, perhaps are not as confident as they want to, want to be. Um, I, I would just um, make the comment on that last one there, um, concerned about asking a daft question, please be reassured there's no such thing as a daft question. You can guarantee it that uh, if you've got a question, you will not be the only person in the room that's actually thinking about it. So it doesn't matter what the question, a question is a question, and if it's something that's troubling you or um, concerning you as a governor, it's perfectly valid and it's uh, perfectly okay to actually ask it, I would suggest. Um, we might put a few caveats on that a little later in the session, but if you've got a question, go ahead and ask. Okay, so we're going to move on now because picking up from that reasonably confident but want to improve, let's start uh, unpicking what that might look like in practice. So the, uh, the, the, the series of bullet points on this next slide show you a range of different information that is made available to governors uh, and provide that opportunity to ask questions. So providing a, a range of different pieces of information, you're using what you know to be the strategic priorities for the school for the year, the school improvement plan or the school development plan, and you are then looking for the evidence for which you will hold the school to account. So it's important with any of these um, documents, any of these opportunities, that you at least familiarise yourself with the contents, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I find it quite useful as a governor to make some notes as I go along uh, and test my understanding because sometimes you have a question at the beginning of a report that is answered somewhere else or in one of the other documents that supports that range of, of materials that you get sent for a meeting. Sorry, Linda, I've just seen a question coming from uh, Haroon saying that uh, there's a lot of jargon used in education, which uh, he's not familiar with. You won't be the only one, Haroon, I can assure you, um, which makes it difficult to ask meaningful questions. I think a lot of these, be it in any of these documents Linda's about to uh, talk about now, if there's anything in there that you don't understand or we don't understand as governors, it's not our fault. It's somebody else's, i.e. the person that actually wrote the document. So if there's ever an abbreviation or an acronym um, something that's there that you don't understand, that's a perfectly valid question. Hopefully over time people will actually uh, get into the habit of actually not using um, jargon and not using abbreviations and acronyms, etc., or at least explain what they are the first time. And Helen's just made a very good point that uh, their clerk provides a jargon buster list uh, and most clerks will be able to tell you uh, where to find something either that they've produced or that, that they've, they've got access to. Uh, and going back to that daft question, asking as a new governor what certain things mean sometimes gives governors who, who maybe have been on the board for a longer period of time an opportunity to learn at the same time because they feel that they can't ask those questions. So please, please ask those questions uh, and uh, clarify that. So let's look at the head teacher's report. So primarily your head teacher's report will have two functions. It will it'll provide compliance data, so it will be giving you information about how the school is meeting its, its, its legal compliance uh, responsibilities. And it will also provide uh, progress information. And the progress information about the school plan in particular is where you're looking for information to uh, to ensure that the school is making uh, the right amount of progress at the right time of the year. So the kind of opportunities that you would uh, get there to question, and, and many head teachers now report by exception, so 
if there aren't any exclusions there won't be um, anything to, there won't be anything to report on that um, but the uh, uh, head teachers reports increasingly for many schools is a variety of different documents that come together the so different um, subject leaders different faculties might be providing different pieces of data and information uh, and for in, in some cases uh, really helpful ways have been um, designed to help governors understand first the headlines so what are possibly three things that this report is telling me that are uh, are things to celebrate and possibly these are the areas in this report where we're still not making as much progress as we might need gives you access to that deeper level of, of uh, information. There's a question come in here from George. George is saying, I'm interested in exploring how to build a culture of questioning in the governing body. Having moved from another governing body, I'm confident myself in asking questions, but I feel the culture in the new one is not to ask any significant questions, and I'm viewed with suspicion as the guy with all the questions. Mm -hmm. I think that's not at all uncommon, George. And I think one of the things that I would say is that there's probably a couple of ways of doing that. Governors have to understand that if they don't ask any questions, governors probably isn't that, e that effective. Uh, Lynn's just been talking about head teacher and subject leader reports. For me, I mean, this is, this is a list that probably is uh, in order of priority of the best opportunity areas for questioning anyway. If head teachers are putting so much information into a report that it doesn't leave scope for um, questions, I think there's some questions about their workload there anyway, but maybe there's a conversation that takes place that says, look, we don't need spoon feeding to this extent. Give us, as Linda says, the headlines so that there is some scope for governor questions. And what we don't want to do is put people on, on the spot and actually make it difficult. But what a lot of governing bodies do now is invite questions on certain key documentation. So if there's a, a major report, such as a financial monitoring report, such as a draft school development plan, Governors submit those questions usually electronically in advance of the meeting. Some can be answered offline as long as they're copied to everybody else, but they can inform perhaps you know, a more meaningful debate that can then take place at a strategic level within the governing body itself. Another piece of good practice that I've seen in a number of schools is where the agenda includes a portion of it, a school improvement portion of it, that is focused on a key area of debate and discussion uh, and that encourages participation from a wider range of governors and it feels less confrontational so if you're going to be talking about um, boys um, literacy uh, and the different the gender split between girls and boys and how the curriculum has been um, has been reviewed and amended so that uh, boys reading is is improved then you can start having a really good dialogue about the kind of things that the school have done and it can be it can be a, a debate and a discussion uh, and that feels slightly less uncomfortable for school leaders than a series of questions which often sounds as if it's a criticism rather than a request for clarification or information yes. Question here from Ellen, who's saying, is there guidance on how often head teachers need to formally write a report? Um, this is a bit of a movable feast. It's different in maintaining schools to uh, um, the situation in academies. There are no rules um, for academies, but clearly there's best practice. Regulations historically used to be more prescriptive in maintained schools and say that head teachers had to write a report every term. I think the current regulations still say that it's actually three times a year, or at least three times a year. Now, for governing bodies now that have a flat structure, the advice that Linda and I would normally give is that, well, th three of those meetings, alternate meetings, have a, a formal written report, but actually the other three make it a verbal update, because again, that's about work, that, that's about workload balance for uh, head teachers as well. But I do think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the head teachers report should be for us as governors. Therefore, as an opportunity, probably on an annual basis, what we should do is actually be reflecting on does it meet our needs? Does it give us information that enables us to carry out our strategic functions of the school? And your only meetings carry out those three core functions. So you have to have some information and documentation that allows you to, to look at those three things. So it may be that in that flat structure, you're looking at the resource type uh, and premises type um, information in one of the meetings and the pupils learning and progress 
in, in another one of those meetings, but you need documentation that supports that discussion. So with a financial monitoring report, a lot of that uh, is going to be around um, the probity, financial probity, ensuring the school is meeting its financial obligations and at uh, slightly different times of years for academy and maintain schools you will be looking at the forward plan your three-year plan but also about the approval of the uh, annual budget with safeguarding health and safety reports and i would argue that health and safety reports are part of your safeguarding overall review what information is provided by your school uh, so that you can be assured that the school is um, monitoring, managing and training staff as things change because safeguarding is an area where um, we see a huge amount of um, information and compliance required uh, but also we'll see um, the any annual changes reflected in September that allow us as governors to hold the school more uh, stringently to account for the safeguarding of, of pupils uh, in our in our organisations. David's making a good point here. Governing boards spending too much time reviewing documents at meetings and not allowing time for discussion and challenge. Now that's an organisational issue and that's something that individually or collectively as governors I think we should be challenging ourselves uh, David and documents should be read in advance Preparation is absolutely crucial. I mean, Noreen's put a comment on here. One thing we can um, help is to have papers and agenda items clearly labelled um, for, uh, as ideas for discussion or, and those for information. One of the things that we do with uh, the schools that we help is actually produce an annual plan that uh, strictly delineates what are the strategic items, and they're the ones that we do talk about. What are the information only items? And the, the clue there is information only, i.e. we're not going to talk about them. And then there's a policy review bit at the bottom. But I think coming back to David's point about the documentation, we shouldn't be reviewing policies on the table at a governing body meeting. That can all be done offline. And then if there are any final comments, that's what comes to the governing body. But the way in which we conduct our meetings, that's an issue for clerks and chairs to have perhaps a slightly broader um, conversation on. And Susan's asked a question which I think probably is fairly uh, more common than maybe we think uh, and, and this is about the idea about being blinded by data which isn't um, very well understood uh, and again we don't have time at governing body meetings to go over the detail of every pupil in the school uh, and uh, some of that data it's about saying, what do I need to know? And that's the headlines. Where is the evidence that shows that that is the case? Uh, and being able to spot those trends and patterns. Uh, and so it's important that you do frame as a board what information you receive so that it allows you to do governance. Just because we can share documents doesn't necessarily mean that that enables governors to govern. Sometimes we are avalanched with information and it's very difficult to pick out the things that we really uh, need to use and need to um, understand and challenge against. Just one last point before we move on from that. I and mean, Julia's just made a good point. She's saying we have the same problem as David. I'm going to say I read David's out a few moments ago. Many governors do not read the papers in advance as we spend the whole meeting asking for clarification. Well, for me, that comes down, I, I absolutely agree, Julia, I think that is frustration, but that's again about the you know, the culture of working in the governing body. Hopefully we've all got codes of conduct now. Um, my code of conduct, and I would expect everybody else to say something about adequate preparation for meeting. And as a chair, I would actually remind people, well, if you'd read the papers, yeah, you can do it in a nice way. I mean, it makes me sound as if I'm a hideous person. I promise you I'm not. But you can say it in a nice way that if you'd read the papers, that is actually there. And I think it's about creating that culture of expectation where we do expect you to have read everything. I mean, the, you know, Many governing bodies don't have envelopes anymore with um, hard copies in, but you know, the most depressing noise you hear as a chair at the start of a meeting is people tearing out open envelopes because you know they've not read them. But it's about creating that level of expectation that we're not going to actually tolerate this. We all read beforehand and we come prepared for the meeting, prepared to engage in strategic dialogue, strategic conversation, which allows us to exercise that challenge that we're focusing on today. And on the flip side, 
head teachers that are still having provided a report then verbally take you through that report at a meeting, I would suggest that that is using up valuable time that you could have uh, been having a professional dialogue. So papers taken as read, create some opportunity through your chair for real dialogue on a couple of the key aspects of your agenda uh, and then you'll get slightly better quality. Uh, and Daniel has uh, raised a question about how do you deal with old governors who've seen it all before. Um, I, I presume that many of us might recognise some of that <clears throat> and I would say again this goes back to chairing and um, trying to involve those people in a different way uh, so that their expertise is recognised but they, they're not able to derail discussion. So let's just finish off this slide and, and move on. There'll be opportunities for more questions as we go along. Um, I would add to opportunities to ask questions your governor visits because you certainly you'll get opportunities there to ask questions so you need to plan your visit carefully uh, and then there are a variety of different things that as board members we might be involved in regarding panels, complaints, exclusions, uh, disciplinaries uh, and those provide opportunities once we've carried out that function uh, sitting on that panel, do we reflect on what, what has happened and do we think of areas for improvement? So we may in substance be agreeing with a decision but we may um, have some very useful reflection that says actually if we were going to approach this next time we might make some changes and how might we make sure those changes are reflected in our policies and our practice. There's a couple of questions um, on a similar theme here about uh, the timeliness with which as governors or trustees we actually receive papers. Uh, again, it's not statutory in academies, but I think academies can actually learn from the statutory framework and use it as a best practice principle. Governors should have papers in maintained schools, governors must have papers seven days before the meeting, i.e. five working days before the meeting. Now, if we're not getting papers, if we're getting them occasionally, that's, that can't be helped. But if we are consistently as governors getting papers late or worse, still having them tabled, that's down to chairing. A, we should all make our views known. It's, just, it's not for the chair alone to actually police um, the government, effective governance in the governing body. But if we are constantly having um, papers tabled, I think what I've done in the past is a very effective strategy to combat that is to say, well, OK, it's a shame because governors haven't had the opportunity to look at this and read it in depth and therefore prepare any effective questioning. So this time we'll accept it. But in future, we will perhaps defer it to the next meeting. The next meeting and exactly the same thing happens. So I said, well, OK, we're not going to talk about it today. Um, governors take the paper away and we'll come back to the next meeting with our questions. That was very effective. It never happened again. Yeah, and I've, I've also come across a, a chair who, who instructed his clerk that he hadn't had the papers by the required time limit, the item goes off the agenda and the, the agenda is circulated without that item, that agenda item. Now, that was a military man who was a chair and I can see how in that he might have uh, taken that view. I asked him if it happened more than once and he said, no, nope, never happened again. But it's about culture, isn't it? In some places that would... Um, that would come across as being really unhelpful. So you have to develop um, a situation where people feel comfortable with only being able to carry out their decisions and their questioning if they've had the material in enough time to be able to understand it. There's a, a, a number of questions around head teachers reports. There isn't a a, for a prescriptive format because every school is different, every school improvement plan is different. Um, there are a whole variety of different ways in which um, head teachers work with other head teachers or they follow on a pattern that has been provided in the past to them. But this is a, a discussion for your board and your senior team. What is helpful for all of you? Because we don't want to create a whole additional amount of work for our head teacher but we do want to get the right kinds of reports 
that will help us to do governance? I think that's true, Linda. I think there's a lot of different models around now. I mean, the uh, perhaps the traditional model of a head teacher report is a uh, you know quite a, in, in some schools a very um, verbose document that uh, does entail quite a lot of reading. Now, I always reflect on how long it's taken a head teacher to prepare that. Exactly what Linda's just saying. Some heads now are doing bullet point lists. Some are doing a dashboard type report. As Linda says, I think it's about what do we want as governors? What are we comfortable with? What meets our needs in terms of the information, the data that we're actually finding useful as governors? OK, let's uh, let's move on at that stage. Um, sorry, we've had a, a, a slight formatting issue with the slides because we've changed over from Windows onto a uh, an Apple format. So apologies that we've got some uh, slightly strange headings on these next couple. But um, what go on and look at, well, what do we think in terms of those tools, those strategies, etc., um, are useful in terms of highlighting the road to effective questioning in you know, 2019 and beyond? And I think the first one for us is absolutely this idea of um, governors asking trails of questions. So we, it's, I think we've moved beyond now the idea where governors realise they have to come to the meeting and ask a question. And I think all of us have probably been in that situation where you can see someone's read their papers, they've prepared for the meeting, they've got their questions scribbled down. The moment they ask their questions, there's that sort of, phew, I've done it, I can relax now. And you see that change of body language. But I think there are still too many governing bodies, certainly in my experience, where governors don't think about the response they're getting to their initial question. And in thinking and considering, reflecting on that response, what further questions does that engender? And I think the idea now is that as governors, we need to be thinking about what that might look like. So we're going to come on and talk a little bit about that. I've got a particular bugbear, which Linda's probably sick of hearing me say, and that's my, my mantra that uh, if you're only asking something because it's interesting, don't bother answer, asking it. You should only be asking as governors, we should only be asking as governors questions that give us useful information. So in other words, it's not about our salacious appetite. And then we're going to, right at the end, wrap up the session with talking about how we ask specific types of questions. And the useful versus interesting is also a good test for when you're filtering the information you've been provided for the meeting. So when you're going through those reports, where, where are the pieces that are useful to your your agenda item uh, and there will be other bits that will possibly be interesting but not be as relevant. Indeed. Um, so forgive me, I'm a, I'm a great fan of Google Images and I thought it was easier to actually uh, put, uh, put a picture of um, Gunter Grass's book on here. But I think for me, when we're talking about these question trails, as a, this is a very good way of demonstrating that deeper level of um, accountability, that deeper level of understanding that we're actually seeking as governors. So it really is this idea that we're, you know, we're not just picking one bit off the onion, we're peeling it back really to get to ensure that our understanding is right at the, uh, the, the core, right at the heart of the subject that we're actually talking about. So yes, we want governors to ask questions, and I think participation is really important in meetings, but we need to think about, is there some logic to the question? So if somebody is asking a question, let's say on a safeguard in front about the, um, how satisfied or otherwise the school might be with the support they're getting from their local authority children's services at the moment with regard to safeguarding, you get an answer, but then somebody asks another question that changes the subject completely. We need to think about, well, hang on, have we, have we done justice to that particular area or are there other questions that may pop up in our minds based on the response that, uh, that, that we've got. So for example, um, there are several local authorities up and down the country at the moment who are, strictly speaking, in um, you know, the equivalent of special measures for the inadequacies in their children's services around safeguarding. Now, if you're a school that's operating in one of those areas, asking that question about how well or otherwise you uh, um, feel supported as a school by um, some of the external agencies, you might get the response, well, of course, it's difficult at the moment because the local authority are in this particular situation. Well, that might be an accurate answer, but if I was in that situation, I'd go and say, yes, but, or so what? So what impact is that having on the safeguarding and the well-being of children in our school? What are we doing to actually ensure that we are providing the best possible care for children in our school? So there's a whole host of questions that actually can come out of that and obviously on a lot of other areas as well. And I think I'd also throw in um, to the mix there a question that we had earlier in, in, um, in the presentation 
uh, from from Gemma asking about how we train governors to be better at asking effective questions. I think that's the wrong way round because if we have a question that we bring and we tick that off our list because we've had an answer, we probably haven't done that follow up of did it give us a full response? Do are we better informed? Is there something more that we want to know? So I think it's about that professional dialogue, improving understanding, and following that trail till we feel that we've exhausted um, that particular conversation. We know enough about it to understand um, that the school is doing all it can, or that there is another action that the, the board needs to take, possibly to the local authority or to the trust that says, we're not satisfied that we're being, that the school is being served as well as it can in this area and um, we're registering this question with you or this challenge with you. Uh, interesting question here from um, Catherine, what do you do about defensive responses to questions? I think that is a good, a, a good question um, Catherine. My personal response to that would be I think head teachers, other senior leaders, anybody who is coming to talk to governors, be it a full governing body meeting or um, committee, has to understand the role of governors. And if governors aren't given that opportunity to ask questions, they're not doing their job properly and that's going to have an impact on the, on the school as a whole. So defensive responses, well, I think we need to actually unpick that and that comes back to this idea about uh, you know, unpeeling un the onion, uh, sorry, peeling the onion rather, is saying that, well, okay, what what is there to be defensive about? Do we understand that as governors? Again, this isn't about confrontation, going back to uh, that curi uh, curiosity that Linda was talking about right at the start of the session. This is saying, tell me more so I understand. I'm not being critical of the school. I just need to understand where we are. I want that balanced, accurate picture at an appropriately strategic level of where we actually should be as a governing body. And can you explain a little more about why the school chose this particular approach. Can you explain a little more how this is going to happen? Has the school understood the risks? All of those things, if you're creating them in a framework of dialogue, um, is, is less of a thorny arrow than what, where, why, when, how, which are, you know is the basis for your question. But the language in which you frame that should be uh, supportive and partnership rather than defensive and critical. Okay, so really this slide that's up in front of you now is just to you know, indicate whatever we're focusing on, as Linda's just been you know, giving you a couple of examples there, there are a whole host of questions, you know, the where, the when, the how, the what, the who. It's about us as governors becoming better informed, it's about us as governors deepening our knowledge, deepening our understanding. And probably the best way of actually giving you an example of that is to move on to um, the next slide where we've actually created a rather unreal situation in many ways, but hopefully this is quite a nice way of uh, explaining what we mean here. So this little section of four, four questions, responses, etc., is supposed to build. So somebody's asked a question, and perhaps you've, the scenario is you've maybe been in a situation where we're looking at the either the inspection data summary report or the analysed school uh, performance report, and it's become very clear that boys' writing isn't as good as girls' writing in your particular school. And a perfectly reasonable question for any governor to ask is, well, what prevents boys performing as well as girls in writing? That's a very good um, yeah, inquisitive question. And the, uh, um, the brackets afterwards in pink indicate, well, on this occasion, the head teacher or whoever is responding has said, well, boys generally tend not to. In other words, they tend not to perform as well as girls. Now, we could just leave it there, or we could say, well, OK, where else do I go with that question? And one of the options here, and it's, it's not the only one, but one of the options might say, well, are there schools locally that actually buck that tendency? So, OK, if we're saying that, boys tend to not perform as well as girls. Have we got so any information at all where schools, sorry, in, of schools locally or even farther afield, where boys are perhaps performing as well or perhaps even better? And the response to that might be, not sure, but we could actually take a look. Sorry, notice it says, not sure that we look at that. Sorry, I can't read my own, read my own slide there, apologies. Um, so again, perfectly valid follow-up to that is, well, can we? 
And again, response there could be, well, I could look at it at the next head teachers meeting, um, ask a few questions, etc. And then a follow on to that is, well, are there any interventions in place aiming at improving, improving boys' writing? So we've broken the thread a little bit, but actually we're going back to the top and saying, well, okay, we're recogni recognizing here that boys' writing is not where we would like it to be, but what are we doing about that? Because just as accepting the status quo without any questioning of where it's going is not terribly helpful for any of us, I would suggest. So we're going to give you an opportunity now to think about how you would develop that thread of thinking, where you might start. Uh, and um, we're going to give you that opportunity to look at a specific uh, example. So if I could ask you to consider the question and then give, uh, using your uh, uh, the question part of the, uh, as you've been doing already in, in answering questions, can you please pose some questions that you might uh, phrase in this situation if it were your school or academy? Okay, so we've got a few coming through now. Um, good one here coming through from Victoria. Victoria is saying, is this an improvement or a deterioration since last year? So uh, yeah, that's a, a perfectly uh, good question to actually put into context that um, very basic information we've got. Uh, Haroon saying, what, what, what was the national average? That's an, that's, a, that's an interesting one. I would always hope that as governors, we would actually be given that information. Liz is saying, what are we doing to improve and, um, sorry, imp improve performance against um, the average? Catherine's got an interesting question here. Okay, but what were the subtle discrepancies? Uh, if you could maybe give us a little bit more information on that, Catherine, that would be really helpful in terms of what, what, you, what you mean by that one. But I think that's a, an interesting question because of course what that's getting to I would hope is that well tell me a little bit more does that go I mean one of the questions I would want to be or well, one of the, the trails I would want to be going personally on this is that well is that true for all pupils because this is a yeah you know, this is a, a generalization isn't it and often where Ofsted have gone into schools historically and I'm not suggesting that we do these things for Ofsted but Ofsted are actually looking at the effectiveness of governance amongst other things is uh, yeah okay that's the overall picture but again we talked about boys versus girls in that writing example a few moments ago what are the splits between the gender what about the other groups of pupils what about our SCND pupils what about our pupil premium or other disadvantaged pupils and i think that supports uh, charlotte's question is is this in line with our expectation well what did you set as your um target in in these areas uh, and and again then breaking it down to say well how many of those pupils reached um, our expectations and how many exceeded that? And what about those pupils in those various groups? And then you would follow that down with your, and what are we doing about it? And there's a lot of people um, putting questions up here in terms of you know, how does it compare to last year? Whilst that's, that's an, forgive me, I'm not being rude in saying this, that's an okay question. And I would always take the view, well, last year was fine, but last year was last year's cohort of children or young people. This is about this cohort of children and young people. And the question we should be asking ourselves is, yeah, does this represent appropriate progress, adequate progress for those youngsters? So for me, I'd be wanting to perhaps suggest that what we should be doing is making our questions perhaps a little more forward focusing in terms of uh, so what question and so what question is, so what else can we do? So we've got quite a few people um, asking questions saying, well, what, what more can we do? Are there any areas where we're not in line that we could look at? Um, and I think those kind of questions are what I would suggest are probably very forward thinking because that then gets us into the idea of saying, well, OK, we're talking about here and now, we're talking about data. But what we want to do is to say, well, what can we learn from that data? What interventions can we perhaps put in place in our schools that give us, you know, hopefully a better chance of bucking that trend next year 
recognizing that it's actually a different group of children. So, you know, what are our aims for next year? I think is a, is a very good question. And I think, um, again, Catherine, uh, you might want to unpick that a little bit more um, just by, you know, looking at perhaps the different subjects. If this, was, if this was in primary, you'd have your split between reading, writing and maths. If it's in secondary, you'd have a whole range of subjects. And of course, the, the different performance measures that we would actually be looking at would come to play there as well. And when you're looking at the smaller the school, if you're in a small primary school, you may be very cohort dependent. So the school where I'm currently chair is a one form entry primary school. We know next year's results are not going to be as good because we have um, a particularly, we have a lot of SEN in our current uh, year five that will be next year's year six. And we know what the interventions are what the expectations, ambitious expectations for that class look like, because we've already thought about that, thought about the interventions, asked about the questions around that. And again, you may have other aspects of the school that you know about as a governor. So we're losing our head of science in our secondary school uh, this year. What impact might that have on science? next year what um if we're changing the curriculum what are the risks and benefits of doing that in relation to our expectations for successful outcomes for attainment outcomes for pupils so there are some other elements that come in depending on your context and again, as we said, thinking about we've got a lot of questions have actually come through. So it's a bit of an avalanche of questions at the moment, which is great. Um, but I think there is a theme here. A lot of people are saying, how does this compare? That's good. We need to have that comparison as a, as a baseline going forward. But the better questions are the ones, uh, so what are we going to do about it? And again, I think as governors, what we can do then is get an understanding of what the school's plans are but then think about, okay, so how is that going to inform my questioning at the next meeting when we're coming back to actually uh, uh, look at uh, perhaps what the impact of these uh, activities might have been? So, for example, you may have put in place uh, something uh, a, a, to boost your results this year in, let's say, math mathematics. And the results show you that you're broadly in line with the national average, but your intention was that that change that you put into mathematics would increase or improve performance either across the whole range or for particular uh, elements of the higher performers or the, the lower performers. So we've got a lot of questions coming in about data here. And again, I think it's worth thinking from a governor's perspective. And again, this might be a focus for uh, perhaps a, a, a future webinar with uh, governors for schools is what data should we expect as governors? Um, it's very easy for um, you know, school leaders, those in charge of assessment in our schools, to present us with a wealth of data. Now, we've had a couple of questions come in this morning that uh, um, do actually make that figure, sorry, make that point rather. But I think whatever figures we're being shown, whatever data is actually being presented to us, what we need to discern as governors, given that our role is supposed to be a strategic one, is, okay, so what are the key messages we want to take away from this? So one of the things that I often say to head teachers, and we encourage clerks to perhaps ask head teachers this, and governors as well, is that, well, okay, you've shown me the inspection data summary report, we've asked lots of questions, we've looked at all of the data, what are the three key messages that as governors you believe we should be taking, uh, taking away from this? And if you can think about, you know, because it, it may be that it's boys writing, it may be that it's science in, uh, in key stage three, it may be it's something to do with early years, depending on which school year, but whatever those three issues are, and again, there's nothing magical about number three, whatever those issues are, they are things that as governments we ought to be aware of, and therefore we should be expecting feedback at future meetings to be set on what the school's actually doing about those most important improvement priorities. Okay, so I think we'll move on there because the, uh, the, the time is actually uh, uh, passing by. Um, just wanted to come back to this useful um, versus interesting. I said some of these things in the introduction to this little section anyway, but 
what we should be thinking about in the questions that we ask. And as Linda said earlier, there's no, there's no magic formula here. There's no formulaic way to be asking questions in governing body meetings. But certainly we should be thinking about always topping up that knowledge that we have as governors, thinking about, okay, how is this going to inform my knowledge so that I'm better informed, sorry, so I'm better informed, so I'm better positioned rather, to ask perhaps more probing, more detailed questions that yeah, don't just benefit me, but benefit the whole governing body in terms of uh, where we are collectively. Don't forget that what, what our key role is, and we've talked about those core functions, but actually you can sum all of those up in the idea that our role as governors is about ensuring through seeking assurance. So what we should be doing is using questions to assure us, to provide that assurance to us, that we are, as a school, providing the best possible learning, providing the best possible care. And we need to think about those questions in that context rather than perhaps sometimes, and certainly I'm sure we've all experienced this from time to time, um, seen questions or witness questions being asked, asked rather, which are perhaps feeding individuals salacious appetites for information rather than providing us with information that actually is genuinely useful and informs effective governance in our schools. This is my, I thought, our, sorry, I should say panels or something. This is one of my um, my real bugbears as, as a governor and something that uh, comes from my, my coaching background. And it's something that in coaching we say to people, oh, coaching is all about helping people improve performance by asking questions. And one of the cardinal rules in coaching is if you're thinking of a question beginning with the word why, don't use it. See if you can change the question around and make it a what question. And I think this has actually got, for me, quite a lot of resonance in governance. And particularly, I mean, I tend to um, use the same example of boys writing in a lot of different situations. But, you know, if boys writing is an issue in our school or the teaching of science, as you know, asking the question, you know, why is it so bad? You might be interested, in that, but that's actually not a terribly helpful question because asking a why question is always going to put somebody on the defensive. It's always a call for justification. And if you think about it, in most schools, if you have a, a teacher, a member of staff saying to a child, why did you do that? Immediately what that does in that child's mind, it does the same for us as adults, is actually say, I don't think I should have done that. Um, I'm now being called to uh, you know, justify why I did. And as adults, it's exactly the same response at a psychological level. So what we should perhaps be doing is thinking about, well, if I've got a why question, why is boys' performance so low? Asking that question that I posed earlier, what are the barriers preventing boys performing as well as girls is a much more open-ended inquiry question. It's a much more friendly approach to it. And hopefully we'll get a lot more qualitative answer that you know, doesn't actually make anybody feel defensive and perhaps avoid some of those pitfalls that uh, we talked about earlier that colleagues were actually uh, mentioning in terms of uh, people getting defensive. So a um, bit of free advice there. I normally charge people £50 for that piece of <laughs> advice, so you've got that for nothing this morning, folks. Um, that really does just about bring us to the end of uh, um, the session, but if anybody has any further questions, we'd be uh, uh, delighted to actually uh, have you uh, pose those now. There's been a large uh, amount of questions because it's quite a big audience this morning. Uh, and we've tried to pick up uh, themes as we've gone through and so if you haven't had your specific question answered by some of the general information we've given this is your opportunity um, but we will have a look through the questions after the session and make sure we haven't uh, missed anything uh, any of those key themes and what we'll also do is, uh, as we did with the last webinar session, um, we'll get governors for schools to actually send the, the list of all the questions over. And if there's any we haven't asked, uh, answered, rather, um, we will uh, respond to those and you'll get a, a, an email back from um, governors for schools giving you uh, our uh, specific response on that. So thank you very much. A couple of people put some very nice comments up. That's always welcome. Um, it's been uh, a pleasure engaging in some uh, dialogue with you this morning. I hope uh, we hope you found the, uh, the session useful and uh, we look forward to welcoming you again in the future. Thank you very much indeed for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.